Welcome to Business Uncorked. We're so excited to have you here right now for Wine Wednesdays. Cheers. Our goal really is to be a really informative and have a fun experience with you while we are interviewing extraordinary leaders talking about topics of business, leadership, culture, belonging, you know, enjoying all of our favorite things with a favorite glass of wine with our guests. You can find Lauren and I live every Wednesday right here on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And in case you haven't had the pleasure of meeting me, my name's Lisa Patrick, and well, I'm considered the Nancy Drew of your business, helping thought leaders create and amplify their personal brands. And I'd like to introduce to you, oh, actually it's this way, <laughs> my friend and partner, Lauren Rubis. Lauren has recently retired from the C-suite as a culture amplifier and is growing his personal brand, Lauren Rubis. And he's really helping others create extraordinary and adaptable cultures. But it's with great honor, and I have goosebumps, to introduce today's guest, Dave Mowat. He's a CEO from retired from ATB and a rock star in the C-suite. He's named by Glassdoor as the number one CEO in Alberta and top 50 most influential people in Alberta. He's sat on the board of stars. He's currently on the TELUS board. And Lauren and I would like to welcome Dave for a happy hour. Hey, Dave. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Hey. How are you doing, Lisa? Hi, Lauren. We're good. It's easier Pretty for me good. to point than you. <laughs> I'm trying to like, which wing? And, and it's opposite, right? The mirror is opposite. So. And you are a brave man. You are in the uh, Vancouver airport. And uh, wow. So obviously social distance off from everybody except for the plant behind you. You're all good? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a insight into the economy right now. There's nobody here. So it actually feels... <laughs> quite safe i'm not sure an airport well there you get get the announcements to i'm telling the truth but um if it was full it would be a different story so everybody seems to be taking the right precautions and staying away from each other and wear masks and yes yeah, so, and it's you know uh and and lisa you know that um i'm kind of, you know I'm, I'm pretty public out there around uh being uh one of dave Moat's number one fans i mean i've just um I had the pleasure of working for him for um, a considerable amount of time, not long enough in my opinion, but a good seven years that were really important and huge years in my life. And I had a chance to uh, watch him become that number one rated CEO in all of Glassdoor. At one point, he had the highest score of anybody in any Glassdoor in North America. It was 99% and uh, pretty hard I to get back. I taught yeah, my mother how to vote. <laughs> I know you're always pretty gracious about it, but um, totally earned and well deserved. And so we're here to, and it's so you know, it's so great to have you part of the our, our kicking kicking this off day because we just felt like business on court. Um, there, well, there are a lot of podcasts out there. Our ability to talk to CEOs and leaders that really kind of have created conditions for happiness. It's happy hour for a reason, partly because we have our glasses of wine and. And we'll have some fun with that. But part part of it is because the world right now, I think, needs some of these more positive and happy kind of stories around around uh, creating conditions for that. And hopefully, we can 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 uh, explore that and um, and and get your thoughts around and your experiences around what you think created some of those conditions for happiness. And we'll share some of the anecdotes between us and the things we did. That uh, well, I, I want stories, gentlemen. I, I want stories. That's all I have to say. Um, I have a question for you, Dave. When you were a little boy, what, what did you what did you think you would be when you grew up? You know, I don't think I had any real clear plan. You yeah. know, banking was always kind of an interest. You know, is it when I was in university, a couple of friends and I had a a loan fund. <laughs> Sounds better than a loan shark fund. It wasn't that. Um, so I think that, that always um, kind of was a curiosity for me. And, you know, I can remember when I did get my first job, I kind of was doing commercial banking and, and my mind was really going to, you know, I can do this for a few years. I get to look at everybody's business. How good is that? It's like walking through a neighborhood when everybody has their lights on, you get to see inside their houses. Um, and I would find a place uh, for myself to be. And I ultimately ended up loving doing it. Uh, banking is 
you know, I think if you do it right, you can be a facilitator uh, for people. And that was a fascination uh, for me. And, you know, then we got on to other things and kind of 40 years later, I was still doing the same thing. <laughs> well, that's a testament to the passion behind the project. Yeah. So Dave, one of the things when uh, we had a lot of debate about this, um, uh, when we, uh, with the help of uh, wonderful people like Peggy Garrity, who was chief of reputation and brand built out a uh, sort of refresh purpose statement for ATB, the word happiness was prominent in there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, what was your thinking behind that? I mean, um, that's a word that's still not seen very much in, um, in, you know, in the business world out the cold. What was your thinking behind that? And how did that emerge to be so much a part of our, our purpose statement? You know, I, I think lots of times, you know, that sounds a bit artsy fartsy. Um, we're going to try and be happy, but you know, I think there was two sides of it. One is um, whenever you talk to customers, you know, they never came up with our competency uh, matrix that we would classically have. What they came up with is somebody who knew what they were talking about and was able to explain it in a way that um, they could understand. And, and so th that in order to do that, you have to be, you have to have an element of confidence, but you also have to have an element of humility. And in order to put those together, you know, it, you tend to need to be pretty satisfied with life and liking what you're doing and having a kind of a happy disposition. And, you know, even I hear myself saying the word happy and it sounds a bit dippy, but, you know, <laughs> that was the customer side of it. When we looked at um, the business side of it, um, people who are good at what they do, they're content in their role, they're happy with uh, where they are, they're more productive. So we made more money uh, with happy people. Grouchy people uh, tend to spend too much time around the water cooler kind of comparing horror stories or kind of seeing cups uh, half full. And it's uh, the people at the other end of the scale literally just got on with things. You know, they're the kind of person that's kind of as hungry as has the ability to be motivated by them not only by themselves, but by their customers. So all of a sudden, everything was pointing at doing a good job for the customer. And as soon as you do that, life just gets a whole bunch easier because customers are asking you for things instead of having to sell. And you're just in a spot where just things take less time. There's less bureaucracy. You, you, we, we tend to overmanage our workforces right now because we can't get people to that spot. When we get them there, it's a much lighter touch of management for sure. Yeah. And um, like, you know, like, and, you know, just a, a bit kind of translate, translating this into a personal kind of thing, Dave. Like, I mean, when you were at your happiest being a CEO, like what, you know, what, what were the, what were the aspects behind that? What made you, like you did every day wasn't a happy day, right? You had some crappy days and moments. Right. But when you were at your happiest, when you were leading the company, what, what was going on? What was there? You know, I think there's two elements. You know, when I was inside uh, the four walls of the place, you know, my absolute happiest days were when somebody thought of something I wouldn't have thought of in a million years. You know, which just means you got some people around you that don't think like you. They're... Um, they're willing to put their ideas forward. And, you know, I think sometimes we create our own ceiling to our organizations because we get to be control freaks or whatever. And, and, and then we're just limited by things we can think of. And so those days when, and, and you know, it just, I would just be beaming kind of thing. And just because I, you could have given me a thousand years and, I, and a scratch pad and I would have never ever thought of it uh, that way and come up with it that way. Um, and then the other side is when you're out um, talking to people and whether it's someone in the community that our people have vo volunteered at or whether it's uh, a person we've given their first loan to to buy a house or whether it's somebody we've helped build their business. You know, I think um, hearing about uh, people's successes and knowing that, 
you know, you're part of something that is helping them get to that success. I think there's an awful lot of uh, reward uh, in that. You know, I, I think as banks, we kind of lost our way a, a little bit, you know, a decade or two, a decade ago, you know, we thought we were the product and we're not, never have been, never will be. We are um, kind of grease on the skids. We, we don't do anything. So I'm going to get cards and letters from bankers now. Um, <laughs> but, but really, um, you know, it's the people who do stuff. People save money, they invest money, they earn money, they create wealth, they run businesses, they create profit. It's those people working hard that, that do that. And what we have the ability to do is provide uh, capital, knowledge, advice to help them do an even better job or give them scale. And, and so that's, to me, that's a very rewarding bit. And I think, so those are my two happiest days, Lauren, other than when you're around. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, one of the things, and Lisa and I want to turn it over to you because I know you got some things you want to, for definitely want to explore. But I saw you, when you were at your whiteboard, like, you know, you were famous for your whiteboard. Like when Dave went to his whiteboard, man, you were in for a ride because, you know, you were like, you were on a flow. You were in a, you were ripping and it was really fun to be part of that. And uh, yeah, so those are, those are, I could see you like when you had that kind of, you were also creating when you were co-creating with people. That was fun to kind of kind of watch too. So Lisa, I know you wanted to go down a couple of uh, roads. Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, God bless the whiteboard. That's all I have to say. I love the whiteboard. Like there's more, I've gone through more, permanent or non-permanent markers on a whiteboard through my career. I mean, that is a staple of business, right? Like, but you said something that really resonated with me. And I think because I'm not from the corporate side, I'm from the entrepreneurial space. I think for those listeners who are asked or are thinking about what you're saying, how did you manage to really truly create and, and I know Lauren this is a lot of your work as well a safe place where people authentically could show up so that they could um, give you those ideas and gift you those ideas and give you a different vision that you might not necessarily have seen um, and they felt comfortable enough to do that and I think that's a unique gift yeah you know and I, I'm not sure there's anything really magic um, but creating a safe place, you know, that's something Lauren, uh, I guess, politely a dog with a bone um, on. But, I, you know, I think all of us got to the spot where we truly uh, believe that, that the organization worked better, the safer and safer it got. That, yeah. that be being said, you can't just say that. So, you know, and yeah. we won best workplace and we won all kinds of uh, stuff. And, you, and some days you'd think it was just a country club, but um, you know, we were like, we have more rule, not rules. We, we have some really clear attributes that we use to get rid of people. And you know, that sounds harsh, but a few things happen when you get rid of the right people. The first thing is the rest of the team says, what took you so long? You know, we've known that for years, that person has been collecting the same paycheck we have been and they do half the work or, or, or whatever. And, and I think something magical uh, starts to happen when you start. And it's not like you're creating the moonies. You're not giving people things, you know, read after me and bow down in the morning, things like that. You're just, uh, it, it's not that people think the same. That, matter of fact, they think more differently because you're getting quite a bit uh, more differentiation in your workforce, but what you're doing is getting rid of people that don't have the attributes that our customers want and that the organization needs to be a safe place to have innovation happening every uh, single day. So Lauren was a big part and, uh, you know, we worked on three attributes that, you know, honest to God, if we, and we never got to this spot, but if we could, we would have had somebody else just go through kind of basic educational requirements and for the most part, just throwing the resumes away yeah. um, because, you know, these three attributes, you know, I won't take all kinds of time and, and explain them, but um, honestly, if you closed your eyes and I explained them to you, that's 
who you want to work with. And that's who you want to be on your team, work for, work with, um, whatever it might be. And and they might not be right, and they probably aren't perfect. But, you know, as soon as you start saying, you know what, we're looking for all three. We're not looking for two out of three. We're not looking at 75% on this one. We're looking for as good as we can get on all three of those. Then you start to um, high grade your workforce, and the place just starts to kick ass. Like, it's... Uh, quite amazing uh, when you, you can see those kind of teams start to form that we've really worked on getting the right people in place. I think yeah, we're in the entrepreneurial space, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't take time, truly. They're, they're running at such a fast pace or they're limited in resources or they don't have the knowledge to actually sit back and be that reflective um, with their attributes and really understand who should be sitting at the table beside them. So, you know, kudos to you guys for, for doing that because I think that's something that all entrepreneurs, small business or, or like small, large, you know, no matter what size the team is, really should take time to reflect on that. So thank you. I appreciate that. One of the things that um, Dave had a magic uh, way of doing it is that all 5,000 people that worked there all felt like they knew him personally. Yeah. Like, I mean, they, like it wasn't yeah. like they knew that it was Dave Mowat. It's like they knew Dave Mowat. If you said, you know, you know, you know, they would say, well, yeah, I know Dave. Like, and it was a lot of pressure on Dave because he had to, it's one of the reasons why it was so helpful to have an ATB name badge because, you know, <laughs> Everybody kind of was like, yeah, you know, don't you remember me, Dave? And he would be remarkable. He would say, yeah, I remember that time when I ran into you. And it was like he was renowned for that. The one of the things, though, that's part of that that goes back to the safety issue is that I don't ever recall anyone saying that they needed permission to go talk to Dave. Yeah. It wasn't like you had to go through the security guard on the 21st floor. Or you had to go through. You know, you had to fight your way past, you know, Doris Day's very capable EA, or me, maybe you did a little bit. But generally, Dave, you were out there talking to people all the time. So if anybody had an idea or a thought, they just know they could they could talk to Dave about it. And and um, but that was we were all, I think we made it that was a model for all of us to be pretty accessible. You you expected there was no, you know, to take the status differentiate, you know, you were available. You were in a leadership yeah. role. You were, you were, you, you, and so we almost didn't need offices at the end. Dave, you had one of the smallest offices. Do we they get the help? We weren't there anyway. None of us really were out there. And a right. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, Doris Nicopolis was, uh, took me six months to spell that name. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long did it take you to say it? <laughs> but she was totally amazing. And, you know, because I, I think you can fall into the trap. Like, you feel pretty important when you're busy. And, um, you know, I think what Doris did for me is gave the illusion that my calendar was always clear. And, you know, I know he wants to talk to you. And, you know, you name the time. And then she would kind of work them to a time. I, so it was, as Lauren says, I think it is important uh, to uh, to be accessible. And, and you combine that with the safety. We, we did a great big um, banking conversion. And I don't know if your bank has ever done a banking conversion, but it couldn't possibly go well. Um, they never do. And so we had this campaign, blue string around your finger and all the branches. And, and basically kind of what it said is, you know, we're going to do a banking conversion. And it's about as exciting as getting new tires for your car. It's a whole lot safer. and It's a whole lot better. But, you know. You don't. You won't even know it. It uh, is there. Am I still with you, Lauren? I think I. Yeah, am. you're still here. I just, I just made you the center of the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I felt important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're the hell yeah. out of both of us. All right. So anyway, we had this campaign that basically said all of that, and plus, you know what? Our staff are learning this system at the same time you are, so don't yell at them. If you want to yell at somebody, yell at Dave. And then we put my email and my cell phone out there, which sounded good in concept. <laughs> but uh, we had 700,000 customers. And, you know, if you do it right, uh, like I never got a 95% mark in university or even a 99% mark. But, you know, if you even if you got 
five percent. There's thirty five thousand people out there that are mad as hell uh, at you because you've screwed uh, something up for them. So anyway, I, so I got got a lot of calls, and, and it turned into a pretty cool thing because we had a little war room of dealing with all the calls. But anyway, there was this one lady. We had uh, this, and everybody can re identify with this: is you get a loan from your bank, and the bank automatically takes your payments out uh, every month or every two weeks or whatever it is, and so that system wasn't working, so we weren't taking anybody's payments. But the system that was working perfectly was one that said sent the Dunning letter that said, you deadbeat, you haven't paid any of your payments, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So that created a little acrimony. So I'm, this lady is on to me and she is really mad and with all, um, she should be, stuff like that. So finally, you know, I'm just trying to bring it to closure. And, and I, so I was texting her and I texted her as ma'am, I will personally look after your loans. And then I sent that, I looked down and it had changed it to loins. <laughs> so anyway, I'm holding my breath and wondering what my next career might be. And I get a little buzz coming back and she says, I think just my loans would be fine. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, that's what you just want to crawl in a hole. Yeah. Well, they had a stupid CEO tricks, uh, just like David Letterman had stupid pet tricks, and they they had quite a few of them at ATB. <laughs> so, you know, and one of the things that um, um, I that I noticed a lot is that when you were um, when you, when we were together, uh, there was like uh, the, we almost had to close your doors sometime if you ever were in the office around the laughter around there. I mean, there was the laughter was a real part of our institution. We were always something funny going on and we la we always took the time to laugh about it and um and you know again dave so now we're in this COVID situation so you know what how, how do you think about it differently but now that we're kind of because you're a pretty tactile kind of guy right you you were out there and here we are now and well, you know what you're thinking about in this remote world that we're living in around these conditions of accessibility and laughter and fun around how do you how do you think about that and as a board member how do you guide management around that you know i, I think well there's two halves of this one is i think there's lots of stuff we're doing quite a bit better you know we've shed we have faster decision making we've shed bureaucracy we're um you know being pragmatic we have shorter meetings um so 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 i think there's lots we're going to take away from this that yeah, yeah. Yeah. is going to be better. You know, I think if if I worry about one thing, and, and Lauren would actually identify with this, because Lauren ran this great, big, huge uh, project for us. We turned the whole place over to Google, and it had real short timelines, and people were working all night sometimes, and huge deadlines and stuff like that. And there's an adrenaline that gets you through that. And, and these people did a fabulous job. You know, Google uses that as a case study around the world now, uh, as how well it went and stuff like that. But when we finished that, we actually had a hard time holding on to a lot of the people because they became this kind of project junkie. They loved the high of getting stuff done and stuff. So, so I think, you know, and I'm not talking about any specific company, but the ones that I kind of watch, um, you know, we've kind of got through it. And one I do know well is tell us, you know, it's it's actually outperformed uh, a lot of its uh, competitors. It had a great digital kind of positioning um, and people are have overperformed. So, and now I'm not talking about tell us, but I, I just, you look at a uh, lots of companies, I think we'll have to, the care and feeding of our people over the next six months is going to be uh, critical because we might, the opposite of a bounce is we might get a sag, you know, it's, uh, you know, when you're running and stuff, the adrenaline wears off, you're just beat kind of thing. And all of a sudden, and I think we're seeing a little bit of it with people going back to school, you know, is, oh my God, this is going to carry on. I kind of got through this and I got through that. And, so I think we just have to watch that because I, I do kind of believe in that emotional bank account. And um, 
I think we've taken a fair amount out of it over the yeah. last period of time. We'll have to watch watch that uh, and just different ways of, you know, I think, and, and, and I think if we learn anything from experiences, you know, if people are gonna sag a little bit, it's the little things that piss them off. And so sometimes, you know, great big important managers, we're not so interested in dealing with the little stuff, but it might be, the little stuff that kind of continues to put the human touch on things, show we care. And anyway, I think it's just something for everybody to watch. Yeah. So we, have uh, a, we have a good morning from Adelaide in South Australia. So it's uh, hello there, Leanne. Thank you for wow. tuning in with us. Um, yeah. I do think people are, though, you know, Lauren and I have had this conversation actually not too long ago about being COVID overload, right? Like you, you just don't have that oomph anymore to do to get to that next because it feels like you're just constrained in, in, in ways of doing things, right? Yeah. One little people story about Dave, and then I want to talk about Vaughn because I'm not sure our audience knows about Vaughn. It's really quite an unusual thing, and I, I can't mm -hmm. help but um, – so. Uh, my wife Kathleen and I uh, were celebrating uh, our wedding anniversary, and we were having dinner uh, next to uh, the the office. And it was uh, we we're going to go to the theater, and Dave comes by the window, and we happen to have a table at the window, and Dave's making faces at us and stuff, and and we're just kind of laughing, and um, and then he disappears, and we finish on with our dinner, and I'm go about to pay, and the Waiter says, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, this has been covered for you. And I know. So he took the time to go back around, pay our dinner bill, and just a way of saying thank you. But stuff like that, he did all the time. And it was it was the thoughtfulness and the care <clears throat> that, and I think bringing that into this remote environment, you have to find other ways of doing it because that was a moment, you know, because we were there and around each other. And uh, the segue that I want to lead to is Vaughn. You know, this drove me crazy. This damn dog. A dog? Did you say a dog? A dog. Like a Dave baby? decides. Dave decides. There's a CEO of the company on the plane and traveling all the time. And he decides to get this uh, dog and train this dog. And we all love this dog. and But the dog became a part of all of our lives. And it's such, really, in some ways, it's just such a crazy damn thing. You're you're running this company, and you decide to get this damn dog. And I, I think people, I'd love to hear the story about about Vaughn, just to share it around. What was your thinking, and and the impact that it had on you and the company, and the whole damn province in some weird kind of a way. So, Vaughn, this is a tribute, and I picked that damn dog's uh, dog poo up so many damn times. But anyway. Uh, not that I'm really uh, well, now, but, now I know who to go to for, for picking up dog dog poo in the years to come. You know, it was part of the thing. If you were going to be around Dave and the dog, you you took Vaughn out for a walk. Right? Oh, oh, I want to do this. The little missing part uh, of that story is uh, Vaughn was in training to work with autistic uh, children and with the blind. So a little plug for dogs with wings yeah. in, um, in Edmonton who trains those dogs and they literally change people's lives. But, uh, you know, I think Lauren, the truth of the matter, and if my wife was there, she said, I didn't even think about it. I didn't have a plan. Um, but, you know, what happened is we went to this demonstration. The Edmonton Foundation was um, kind of showcasing the various charities and Dogs with Wings is one of them. And, and what the dogs can do is amazing. Uh, like they, you know, if you're standing at the bus stop and you're blind and you drop your quarter or your loony or your bus ticket, that dog can actually pick it up and put it back in your hand. And he will recognize, you don't have to say, I dropped something. He will be watching and he sees that. Or if you're in a wheelchair, he'll help you take your pants off at night. You know, you'll pull, he'll even work at taking your, uh, socks off. He'll go over the house and turn off all the lights, you know, in the house because a blind person can't tell if the lights are on. And so, and what they do with autistic children is like, and I'll start crying if I tell that story, but um, I could have done it without, like, I had no idea. Like, I, I, it was kind of a romantic thing to do. 
I should have known because the place is really uh, particular about who raises their dogs. You can imagine there. I think that they got about forty thousand dollars in each dog by the time he gets to two years old. But anyway, so so it's like they want to trial you out, and so they give you about a six-month-old dog, uh, and for the weekend, and just I guess if you kill it, you know, you don't. <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. And if you don't treat it well, you're not going to be uh, one of their puppy raisers. Anyway. Uh, we had some, uh, Sandy and I had some stuff we had to return to Ikea, just in and out and stuff like that. So it took two to carry it. So we left him in the, the car and we just ran in and came back and he had eaten the console of my car. So like $5,000 worth of, but I should have known at that point I wasn't uh, cut out. But anyway, as Lauren says, uh, it was really, um, it was actually hard on my self-esteem because everybody wanted to know where Vaughn was. If I ever showed up without Vaughn, ooh, <laughs> well, you know, it was, and, and how long was Vaughn with you? Um, about 14, about month, 14 months. Yeah. Something like that. And then you had this emotional reunion, didn't you? About yeah. what, not too long ago, right? Yeah. The young lady, Leanne, uh, who has him, you know, and she suffers from a variety of things um, anyway, it, which physically and kind of mentally caused her. She was almost a hermit. She wasn't going to school, I don't think, and was almost just living in a room. They gave her Vaughn and he became kind of her best friend. All of a sudden she was going to school. And this reunion Lauren's talking about is um, when I was retiring, they brought Leanne and Vaughn in and she gave a speech to, I don't know, two or 300 people, Lauren. Um, and her parents were just crying because they had never seen, that wasn't even their daughter. Yeah. They, they, they wouldn't do it, let alone she, would she ever uh, do it? And now it was, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> you know, you know, there are so many funny stories. Like the dog flew pretty much first class. Um, Always yeah. collaborated with the dog. And pretty much everybody knew him, like Dave said, and, you know, and, but there are moments like Dave and I went to a, we were invited to a, remember a, those Eagles had that concert at the uh, thing and we brought, them. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been to the concert and they're playing, but it was so hard in his ears that Dave had to take, take him out of there. And, and, but there were times I was trying to give a speech one time and Dave just let him in there. And I, Pretty soon, like I'm trying to talk to the audience, and everybody's turning around looking at me. <laughs> them. It was like trash my speech, and but we there were so many funny stories. But he became part of our fabric. But he was such a statement about about you, and um, I don't know. I just uh, it was just quite a remarkable kind of an unexpected addition to a statement about your care and anyway, and making us all more vulnerable and more real, I think. Don't you think, Dave? In a weird kind of a way. It had that. It did, yeah, and it, I think always, I, well, to the young lady who has Vaughn right now, it pulled her out of her shell because people wanted to talk to her because she had this cool dog who could do all kinds of things. And I think that happened to all of us, you know, and when, we went into a branch all of a sudden it's just easier you know if you were a a shy boy in grade eight and you met a pretty girl who had a dog it would be a whole lot easier to talk to her than it would be if she didn't and stuff so and i think that that happened to us around the organization hey lauren there's mike lebrec is on the call hey mike yeah great to have you I um so so now with all your board work that you do, Dave, do you recommend that they get a dog if they're having trouble? <laughs> yeah, it could be. Could, it wouldn't hurt, let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you. No, it's uh you know, and the last word on this, as I say, um yeah. <laughs> I, I get credited with Vaughn, but really it was Doris and Lauren and all the people on our floor really like he, when he needs to go, he needs to go. And when you're on the 11th floor, you know, it's a little bit of work and stuff like that. So <laughs> he was raised by the family. 
It was when it was minus 35 that it took on a different context, but they, uh, but no, it was, uh, we, we, there was just part of our, it became part of all of us. And, uh, and one of the things that, um, that when, when we, the kind of fun, you know, back to happy hour theme a little bit, um, you know, what, what are the, we always made time to kind of have these kind of laughs and that kind of, and, and stuff. It was kind of like, we always made some room for sort of the, you know, the personal side of that. And um, like, so what, you know, this idea about, you know, um, all business is kind of personal. How do you, you know, you know, how did that become part of your thinking and what's just your advice to people out there as they listen to you and your leadership role around that whole personal side, making those personal connections? Yeah. You know, and I think um, that's what our customers want. You know, everybody, you know, they want you to be competent and they want you to know what they're do- you're doing. Um, but really, you know, they want you to be interested in them. They want you to be interested in their business. They want you to understand what they're doing. They want you to un- remember their kids, you know, especially small entrepreneurs and stuff like that. There's they're very proud of their kids and they're very proud of their business. Um, and so, so I, I think um, it's good practice inside the organization to make sure we're kind of modeling that all the time. And, you know, I think making those personal connections, Lauren is the guy that really pioneered this stuff uh, for us. It just puts everybody at ease. And when you get better at it, works better on your sports team at cocktail parties at your church in the band, whatever you just be, you know, I can remember I'm not really an extrovert and I've trained myself to, I used to hate going to cocktail parties. You just always admire that person who stood one place and never moved. And, you know, that, which just means a conversation kind of flowed around them. And you know, I think we're all self-conscious that we're kind of walking around and trying to make, make it look like we're talking to lots of people and stuff like that. <laughs> well, you know, but, I, want to, I want to explain, you know, I think people don't, don't think of you as an introvert, but I know that you are, you're maybe more of an omnivert, but I think you're more of an introvert than extrovert. Um, you used to, uh, you and I did this a couple of times, but you used to um, host a dinner. Uh, people would bid on it an auction at, at Dave Moet's house and Dave and Dave would cook and I would, uh, be a sous chef or wash the dishes after or something like that. But we did that. Why would you go and do that? Like what's the, you know, you got 5,000 person, $50 billion in assets, kind of a big shot. And here you are, you got teams that have been in auction and having dinner at your house and you're cooking dinner. And what's the story behind that? You know, I think at the front of it, we raised some pretty good money. You know, the fact we had a 5,000 person organization, we could get people bidding, against themselves so we got a hell of a lot more money than that the meal that you and i might cook uh worth but um you know it it creates uh and i don't think you set out to try and do it but i think maybe what kept us doing it is that you know it creates a little bit of urban legend around the organization you know the person who came in from the branch that had a little bit too much to drink and, you know, told me off or told me how stupid <laughs> they thought my last plan was or something like that. And, you know, that, um, you know, I think that gives the rest of the organization and, and she didn't get fired kind of thing. And so, so then becomes a bunch of stories coming out of that, that, you know, you usually go along with and they're no longer with the organization. Kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> they all were. And um, yeah, there were, there was one, a very funny one is um, we had some, and I can't remember where she was from. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because I probably identify the guilty. But uh, I think there was uh, somebody from one of our rural branches uh, who had bought it. And it came as a couple's thing. And I think what we have, Lauren, five couples, usually 10, yeah. Yeah. 12. Yeah. So anyway, so I think uh, her husband got sick at the last moment. So she invited her friend. And so her run came. She wasn't a, she wasn't a team member at ATB or anything else. Uh, 
and she but she was an ATV customer, and she just started ripping ATV. <laughs> like she, <laughs> and, the, and the CEO, you know, he does this, <laughs> and he's on the radio. What an idiot, you know. <laughs> she had no idea. And plus, it became a bit of a game because everybody kind of looked at each other and said, well, let's let her go. <laughs> Kind of funny. It's this yeah. kind of the scenario where you start talking about somebody and then everybody's quiet and you're like, they're behind me, right? Yeah, right. It's kind of that scenario. Right. Right. Yeah. It was uh it was good. I think the one that we didn't go we had a pasta making party, which uh is actually quite a bit of fun, but it, everybody ends up with flour all over everything and they're all dressed in their good stuff. And I think we sent people a lot home with an awful lot of flour on them. <laughs> it was good pasta though, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, as you're kind of, um, uh, as you kind of reflect on, um, on that, on your ride as the CEO and now that you are kind of retired, um, and if you were going to write a memoir, um, and this, we never, we're not rehearsing any of this stuff. What would you um, what would you name the title of the book? Do you think? Trials and tribulations of Lorne. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> As I try and think of an answer for that, I see Dan Allen is on. Dan used to run our small business uh, practice, hey, and was probably the best customer service person we uh, we had. He was always on it, and. Dan, I wasn't awake at 12.15 a.m. I just would time it so it looked like I was awake at 12.15. Uh, anyway, Dan's had some issues with his ticker, and uh, from the pictures I see on social media and stuff, it looks like he's made 110% recovery, so that's... Uh, I think he's leading the, uh, the United Way effort in uh, in Calgary, right? I think oh, Dan wow. carry that. Yeah, that's so, great. That's yeah. great. Um, well, I, so Lauren had told me, uh, Dave, that you recently were in an accident. And how, how are you feeling now after your accident? Are you re relatively recuperated or, or have you seen any long term effects from it? No, it was a momentary lapse in risk management. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, two sons and a son-in-law, and we were up uh, mountain biking by Squamish in Vancouver between Whistler and Squamish, and on one of these very steep downhill runs. And anyway, I was going too fast trying to keep up to the youngsters and hit a loose rock. I ended up, uh, I broke a wrist, dislocated a finger, separated my shoulder, and broke my ankle, uh, which. Um, if you want to add that all up and try and figure out how you go to the bath, no. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, hey, we're uh, not saying this is uncorked, so that's yeah, not great. Right. So oh, it's yeah, it's getting better. Although I, I, the sad realization is, this stuff takes four to six weeks. The four yeah. weeks are for sixteen-year-olds, and uh, yeah, it's coming along. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just I feel quite lucky I'm still talking to you and not through a draw or something like that. So I, I think if you know, I'm going to answer my own question around the title of your book. Nothing's changed. Is think I, One of the things you taught me was um, that, that to think differently about is that I think one of the things you said to me was that um, you said to often you said to us around that we don't think big enough that sometime – you had this thing about you had to be confident and humble at the same time, but um, that sometime we did we just didn't think big enough that we were we could talk ourselves into being instead of thinking about being the best organization in the world, we're just a little company in Alberta, and um, I think I'd write your I think the title of your book around thinking big would be um, I I think you thought big and you made us all think bigger and. Um, so what was behind that? You know, a little boy growing up in Sherwood Park, shooting arrows in the um, in the air, and um, thinking big. How did that happen? You know, and it's it's interesting because I would say that is a shortcoming 
I have is that I really don't think uh, big enough. Like I'm just in awe of, um, Lauren uh, made a connection for us at the most senior levels of Google. And so we were down in California several times and got to spend some time with, um, you know, the really senior people there. And, uh, you know, their goal was to solve world problems. Like, like, you know, mm -hmm. I think they're taking a bunch of antitrust flack right now, but, yeah. you know, quite honestly, I'd just as soon, you know, large countries were in the hands of those people rather than the people they're in right now. Like they do a quite a bit better job and they would have the interests of the world at heart. And so those guys, men and women don't think about keeping their jobs at Google and I'm sure, you know, they're, they're seen, you know, I think they're kind of maligned right now and I'm not trying to be a groupie or anything else, but uh, I mean, and even uh, I'm on the board of TELUS and Darren Entwistle, I have a bit of a man crush on, on Darren. Like there's a guy who just is always thinking of the next step. So I, I think I aspired uh, to do that and I always think I fell a bit short, but I think that's where it comes to if you surround yourself with people that think differently than you, um, you'll always be thinking of stuff you can't think of yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, Lisa, I wanna, there's two things. One is that we're kind of, this is our first session and I know you have a bunch of stuff that you wanted to ask mm -hmm. and, and we never really put a time limit on it. We were kind of gonna say, you know, when we're kind of done talking, we're done talking and, and, um, and but I wanna make sure that I don't, I could hog the time just reminiscent with Dave, we could spend hours together. And uh, what else is well, on I think it's Very interesting. Uh, I know that Dave has a flight, so I don't know if we can hold them up too long, but uh, I, I think that, you know, your stories and about thinking bigger and, and think big, I happen to know somebody who could really help you with writing that book, by the way. <laughs> I, I think Lauren's on to something, Dave. Yeah, there I know. I, you know, think you do the world the disjustice if you didn't take what's up here and I have a lot, you know, I talk about this often with a lot of thought leaders and put it on paper, um, you know, for generations to come. It's really important, even though you might not think that you're a, a think big person, but most people don't even think close to what you think. And you're aspiring to be bigger and think bigger. And, and that's a true testament to you and, and how dedicated you are to what you're doing. Yeah, there's a couple of just, uh, I'm going to just ask you to kind of respond to a couple of things quick. They might be informative to all of our listeners and watchers. One is that um, you, someone says to you, um, we think we can have a branch on Boyle Street, the uh, poorest postal code of in Canada, maybe, or one of them. Um, and the homeless can actually save money. And... You know, we are concerned about our EBITDA performance and our net income performance, and you decide to pave the way for that. What's your thinking there, and and how do you how do you get all your net income numbers and then do something like that as well? Why would you do it? Um, you know, I think because we could. You know, like I, I think it was. Uh, you know, this is one thing that, uh, you know, I, I go back to Darren Antwistle at Tell Us is, you know, he talks about social capitalism. And, you know, I think, Lauren, we were coining um, something like that uh, as well. And, and, and really, I think what it speaks to is the long run. And, and, and if you're in it for the long run, you probably actually do have to put your shoulder to some of the social problems uh, that we all share because uh, communities get stronger, um, they do more banking, they buy more telecom services. Um, if you can make a organization healthier, it thrives. Your taxes, you know, if you can flatten some of the healthcare costs. So, so I think it's it's having that long run. And I think the other was. Um, we are like tell us uh, and i'll stop talking about tell us and I'll, I'll, but atb um we were in a position to do it and i think if we don't do it it never gets done and it's not because we're super smart it's just that 
we have this huge infrastructure that's already paid for. So the marginal cost of us opening a branch in Boyle Street was almost zero. It wasn't quite, but it was almost zero because it was just like the 180th branch of ATV. It doesn't cost us anything more to hook into that uh, pipeline. And, and then it was, you know, just a fascinating challenge because um, one of the, you know, and here's other people thinking of ideas I wouldn't have thought of. Matter of fact, I think I almost vetoed, not vetoed, but said, you know, like, I don't think that'll work. Uh, is we ended up using uh, biometrics in to identify people in the poorest postal code, I think probably in Canada or at least in Alberta. Um, and I was I was in the camp to say, yeah, people won't trust uh, that. But again, when you go back, if you think about it, the number one hassle in banking, whether you're a street person or whether you're one of the three of us, is we keep getting asked for ID. And you know, this bank who's supposed to know you, you've been dealing with it for 40 years. Are you kidding? You don't know who I am? You know, and they do, but they're just appeasing some money laundering, like registration is you need to see ID from everybody, even if you know them and stuff like that. And so that is compounded for somebody who's a street person because they don't have ID or they lost their ID, or if they do have ID, they uh, aren't able to have it with them. And so if you don't have ID, you can't get a bank account and you can't do banking. And if you don't have banking in Canada, you're marginalized. Like that's a strike one, two and two and a half. Like even if you wanted to work, you find me an employer that is willing to pay you in cash anymore or pay you in a check. We all want to direct deposit it to your account. So if you don't have a bank account, all of a sudden you're not getting a job. And so, so anyway, so our technology people were playing around with iris scanning and fingerprints. And so this thing uh, was put together and everybody was either fingerprinted or their iris were scanned. Um, and so they never come into the place and they never ever had ID. And it actually gave them a sense of identity because all of a sudden nobody's screwing around with me, nobody's hassling me, my thumb if I could ever put my thumb into the screen, my thumb is me. <laughs> and when I put that down, I'm me. And you'll believe me. And it actually gave them a sense of, I'm not sure if it was worth or, but, but uh, as opposed to my initial, God, nobody will ever go for that. They loved it. And the thing, so we have this, as I say, a bank, and, and I say it's staffed by the people from the street. And so they, show respect when they should. And actually they're a little tough when they should be, but you know, if it's Dave or Lauren getting tough with someone, you know, chances are we're not getting tough with the right person. So it, it has worked extremely well and, and I'm not completely current on it, but it got robbed once and they figured out the people on the street came to their uh, defense and went to the people and said, give it back. And it came back. So. You know, I sorry. didn't know that story. That's an amazing yeah. story. That's amazing. Well, and yeah. I would think to the identity of being like the fingerprint or the iris gave the people on the street an identity as well. Like it, it made them feel like they mattered. Exactly. That they were recognized. So, yeah, I know it was, uh, and, and it made the people of ATB pretty proud to, to do it because, you know, they would always say a lot of times we, we joked about it, not in a, not in a, because it was funny, but because we could have said that if you wanted to raise the net income of of ATB, Dave, you could have done that overnight in a couple, right? Just shut down a bunch of branches here and there and do a bunch of other things that we didn't that we didn't necessarily have to do. But we always said the bank that ATB would more than a bank. That our purpose drove drove our our thinking that that we'd really try to make banking work for people. It wasn't perfect. No organization is, but you always helped us drive back to that purpose and. That was a big differentiator for our culture, and and um, and I think that's what we're trying to do here: is that inspire uh, leaders um, that listen in at wherever they are to lead from where they are, uh, where they're at. I think uh, people need uh, great places to work, and I think um, to create conditions for people to really contribute and to bring their very best is, is uh, something that we need to put more intentionality to it. 
and we can still make a hell if we're commercial and we can still make a hell of a lot of money doing it and um and i think um you, and i i'm with lisa i think you should write that book i think it inspires and paves the way for other leaders to think around what they might learn from those lessons and we can't thank you enough for being part of our first kickoff around this and you know we're going to have other ceos and chairmen of the board and other people on it but um i think you you kick in the first um the the ball off the tee i don't know if i can use that metaphor these days or not but um uh i think it was uh it's 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 uh it's great so um Lisa, what else do you have to say before we kind of let Dave go catch his flight? Yeah, I think that I want to, you know, close the show out with asking if you were to give one piece of advice, and it wouldn't matter if it was a leader of, a, of an entrepreneurial company with a staff of five or a staff of a thousand, what would be that one piece of advice moving forward? You know, we're moving into the quarter four of COVID and we don't know what the new normal is going to look like. But what's that one piece of advice that you think that everybody could use? Yeah, and you've asked the question in the context of COVID. So I, I'd go back to that. I, I think this is a time for us to look after the little things. It's going to be, you know, it's it's never the thing that sets somebody off or the things that loses you as a customer or the things that you don't get a sale or wh whatever it might be. It's never just that one thing. It's yeah. things leading up to it. So I, I think we're going into a time, uh, you know, the, the chief health officer here has this say that everybody's tagged on to, and it's really, you know, talks about being considerate uh, to people. And so I think those small things yeah. are, we're gonna become more brittle as kind of employees, customers, human beings. And I think we all need to be uh, thinking that those uh, little things will become increasingly important for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, what would be your piece of advice, Lauren? Um, well, if you're smart enough, you're going to find a CEO like uh, Moa to work for. That'd be a good one. Uh, the, you know, I, I, I have this mantra, and I think Dave uh, helped me form it. It's around um, this idea about it's kind of built on this African uh, proverb around I'm not going to say it exactly right, but in order to move them out and you have to pick up all the little stones, right? First. And it's kind of like thinking big and starting small and act now that kind of, you know, I think my time at ATB helped me frame that, that uh, way I kind of use as a signature and Dave, you really influenced that. And it's, you know, uh, this thing about think big, starting small, acting now, and you can do a lot of things when you, have that frame of mind and you have a growth mindset and you're with other people that make it help be help you become fearless yeah. and you're yeah. going to make a mistake you're going to screw up and i did lots of it at atb and a lot of times dave was pissed off and and uh i get it but uh always in a way that let me learn fast from it and not be afraid to keep going forward and and um and i think uh that adds to that environment so anyway um yeah, maybe, thanks. Maybe, Lauren, just to pile on that a little bit, this is as close as I'm going to get to a political kind of soapbox. Uh, but, you know, I think something that Lauren and I really kind of traded on is that concept of contradictions. It's, uh, it's you know, a customer, you know, somebody who's really, really smart and has no humility is just a bit of a jerk. And somebody who's got all kinds of humility and not very smart, just a goof. And so what customers uh, want is both. And so, you know, this world that has veered far to the right and far to the left, ne neither one have a solution for any of us. Like it's totally, it's got, it, it's unworkable uh, without bringing, because, some of the right's agenda is a good thing and some of the left's agenda is a good thing, but all of both, neither of them uh, are functional. And it's just like anything in life, you know, it's balanced diets, you know, whatever it, it might mean. And, and I think, you know, I, I think, and, and I'll just call it myself, you know, I, I, we've lost our voice. We, we've let the far right and the far light left and they fib. You know, they don't necessarily tell, they tell stuff out of context. And, and so I think what we've 
done, anytime you get a bad result, I think you got to look in the mirror and say, like, we caused that. Like, I think we've been silent. So if you're watching an NBA game and it says vote, vote, you know, like it's, we get what we deserve. And I think we have to be talking, whether it's in business or whether it's politics or what it is, is it's that combination of those contradictions. Contradictions are not bad. You know, I think I'll butcher the saying, but there, and I'm, whether it was one of the Kennedys said it or somebody said that, you know, the sign of a genius is someone who can hold two opposing thoughts in their mind and not be frozen to inaction. And, you know, we've allowed that to morph into an opposing thought is wrong and it's not, you know, the, the two modify each other to create a thought neither of you have. And, uh, you know, this is, we're just going through a bad stretch uh, right now where we think right or left are our only opportunities. You know, that's a great kind of, a, maybe a closing kind of a thing. And it's also kind of, I wrote this blog about you being a paradox leader because I think you revered the paradox, right? I think you used to say, if you were in Alberta, you had to be comfortable in cowboy boots and Jimmy Choo's. Um, and that contradiction being, you know, being able to bring both sides of the argument brought you to a better place if we really listened and actively cared and listened for each other. And that's a great message to leave us with, Dave. Thank you so much. You know, more than uh, uh, having worked for you, I consider you a, a friend and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I don't say thank you to, uh, to you enough, Dave, for everything. Um, I love just hanging out with you. And Lisa, thank you for this. Great kickoff, I think, for us. So um, I guess I'll let you kind of sign off, Lisa. And uh, Dave, safe travels. Get better. Heal yeah, fast. thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lisa. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Dave. And I, we very much look forward to your new book called Think Big. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave.